Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, what, what a crowd. Alhamdulillah, this is seriously the most amazing problem to have. I wish every masjid was like this too, right? In every convention, in every class. MashaAllah, Allah mazid wa barak. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. The brothers and sisters, the hadith that I'm about to share with you contradicts absolutely everything you've heard so far in this convention. I was sitting here last night and I was listening to Sheikh Abdul Rahman Khan talk about how. Nothing contributes to happiness that is material in its nature. And I'm going to share with you a hadith that conflicts with all of that. It literally refutes everything that you've heard for this entire convention when it's not explained properly. In an authentic hadith by Abu al Harith, the Prophet وسلم, he says, There are four components of happiness. You ready for this? He said, A good spouse. Having a good companion is a component of happiness. He said, al jaru salih having a good neighbor is a component of happiness. So those are kind of understandable because then you have people, right? A good wife, a good husband, a good spouse, a good neighbor. Then he says, al-maskanul wasi' having a big house. And then he said, al-markabul hani. The literal translation of al-markabul hani, and you've got Mr. Arabic here. Literally, it translates into a sweet ride, doesn't it? Literally, Markabul Hani means a sweet ride. And Rasulullah said, And there are four components of misery a bad spouse, a bad neighbor, Al Maskan Al Dayyiq, a very constricting small home, and the Prophet said, a bad ride. Now, what is amazing about this hadith, number one, is that the Prophet ﷺ just acknowledged that these things contribute to a person's happiness. These are components of happiness. There's no doubt about it. But here's the question. From those four things, what did the Prophet ﷺ have? Just number one, <laughs> a good wife. The Prophet ﷺ did not have a good neighbor. The Prophet ﷺ did not have a big house. His hujra, his apartments, his chambers alayhi salatu wasalam were nine by four. They were so small that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam used to tap the legs of Aisha radiallahu anha whenever he would make sujood. Did the Prophet sallallahu have a sweet ride? No. The Prophet sallallahu never rode a good camel or a good horse. In fact, his, his, his saddle was described as being worn out. So what is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam telling us? You know, he's telling us that, you know what? If you have a car that doesn't break down every five minutes, you're more likely to have a good day than someone who does. Having a good, nice space to live in, having that space can be good. It can contribute to your happiness as opposed to living in a very small place. Having a good spouse can certainly contribute to a person's happiness. Having a good neighbor can certainly contribute to a person's happiness. But the fact that the Prophet ﷺ himself does not have, except for one of those things, shows you what? Your happiness cannot depend upon those things. Your happiness cannot depend upon those things. Abdullah ibn Salam anhu, one time he walked into a masjid and the people saw him praying and there was this man who was from the Tabi'een. He never met Abdullah ibn Salam and the people were talking about how righteous this man was. And now this is a man of Jannah. Abdullah ibn Salam, the man who was a rabbi, the chief of the rabbis before Islam. And this man sees him praying and the people see him praying and they're speaking well of him. So this man goes up to him and he says to him, I heard the people saying this and this and this about you. What is it that's so special about you? And Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, you know, subhanallah, it's not befitting for people to say that which they don't know. I'm not that good person that they were talking about. But what is it that they were talking about? He said, I once had a dream that I was in a garden of Al-Jinan, a garden of paradise. And in the middle of that garden was a pole. So he said, I walked in that garden of paradise to that pole, to that Amud. And he said, as I got to that pole, I looked up and I noticed a handhold, a grip at the top of that pole. 
So I looked up at it and I was commanded to ascend to grab onto that handhold. And I thought, I said, how am I supposed to get all the way up there? And he said, and then an angel came from beneath me and blew until I ascended all the way up that pole and I grabbed onto that handhold. And he said, I woke up and I told the Prophet ﷺ the next day what I saw. And Rasulullah ﷺ said, Amma as for the garden, Faraudatul Islam. That is the Rawda, that is the garden of Islam. And as for the Amud, as for the pole, that is the pole of Islam. And as for the handhold, that is Al Urwatul Wuthqa, the trustworthy handhold that never breaks. That if a person grabs onto that handhold, they will never be grieved. They will never be taken away. They have entrusted their affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have meaning. They are grateful in their times of ease. They are patient in their times of hardship. They have meaning in their lives. And so as long as that handhold is not being sacrificed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never let it break and Allah will never let you go. As long as that handhold is still sturdy and it will always be sturdy, that person cannot be shaken. Because that person's purpose is stable, it's consistent. He has meaning in his life. And you know, James Baldwin, because religion always takes this beating, because if you know you go to any philosophy class, and really it's a war on religion and a war on Islam specifically, but it's a war on religion in the field of academia and all the circles of academia. History professors will say religion is responsible for the world's violence, where religion is responsible for all of the hatred, religion is responsible for crime, religion is responsible for this, religion is responsible for that. Of course, ignoring that the Crusades were because of an econo the economic bankruptcy of Europe, that all of these terrorist groups that we have today are for political reasons and not religious reasons. But hey, it's under the banner of Islam. The Ku Klux Klan is under the banner of Christianity. Religion is to blame for all of this. And we'd all be at peace. Of course, these people have never read about the Marxist revolution. They've never read about the Tamil Tigers. They've never read about Japanese kamikazes. They've never read about the oppression that takes place in so many different parts of the world under a secular regime. But you know what? It's all religion to blame. You know what? Fine. What about all of the positives? What about the meaning that it gives to a person's life? What about purpose? Because I, I know for myself, I can say this without any hesitation that if it wasn't for Islam, I would be a miserable creature. I would be a miserable human being. I would have no purpose. And you know what? I would not be able to weather any storm. And you know what James Baldwin said? He said, the man that needs to be feared most in society is someone who has nothing to lose. People that, are ha that have meaningless lives, lives of no purpose, that will inflict meaningless on other people's lives because they can't deal with their own meaningless lives. New town, right? Those types of shootings. What would drive a person? What makes a person so sick to go and murder little children in an elementary school? Meaningless. There is no life. And you know, subhanAllah, when Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, istajeebu lillahi wa lirrasooli idha da'akum lima yuhyeekum. O oh, you who believe, answer your, the call of your Lord and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if they call you to that which gives you life. Because if you don't have purpose, you don't have life. And you know what? That's why people who have all of the great circumstances for happiness in the world, because people think that happiness means that I can chill and I don't have to do anything, that I live a stress-free life. People equate a lack of stress and a lack of work with happiness. But the opposite is actually true. Because when people have nothing to do, they become miserable. They give themselves work. Because everyone needs to feel productive. You need to feel like you're achieving something meaningful or else life becomes not worth it and so people will take their own lives. So don't, subhanAllah, people think that if I'm not, if I'm not committed to Islam, if I have no commitment, then everything will be okay. You know, man, those atheists, they must be living it up. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to answer to nobody. Number one, there's no such thing as a true atheist. And this is our creed as Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, no such thing as a pure atheist. They all believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those people who need science to confirm Quran and Sunnah, read about the God spot. 
Every single person believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Edward Young, who's a professor in Princeton, who ran lie detector tests on atheists and they all failed their lie detector tests. You know what he said? He said, you wouldn't be arguing with God and you wouldn't be mad at him if you didn't believe in him. You're just mad at him because your dad didn't buy you a PlayStation when you were 13. All right? Something happened in your life and you couldn't, what, you couldn't understand why. And so you decided to tell yourself that nobody knows why. It makes no sense. I'm just gonna do whatever I feel like doing. And let me ask you this question. Have you ever met a happy atheist, content with Sakina, tranquility? Like, have you ever met a humble atheist before? <laughs> They're always confrontational. They're angry people because that void is there and it can't be filled with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're ignoring that. And so that's misery in and of itself and shaqa, the opposite of sa'adah that the Prophet ﷺ describes, the opposite of happiness is shaqa, means deprivation. Shaqi, deprived, deprived of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore, lahu ma'ishatan dhanka, they have a suffocating lifestyle. Now imagine that person having a meaningless life in and of itself is miserable. Imagine when that person has to deal with a tragedy in their lives. How are they supposed to weather that storm?